What's up guys, welcome to the Ozone and welcome to another audiobook. So today I am reading the final story on this book, The Music Box, which was a competition that I ran uh, called Fazbear, Fazbear Writes, I almost said Fazbear Writes, uh, and the second one is out now, so all you have to do is write a story um, based on a title, essentially, and then I pick the best three stories. But today we're reading the fourth story, which is actually written by me, uh, because I take part in these as well, uh, and this is called Life on the Strings, and I'm pretty happy with how this story went, so let's read this, let's remember this time to zoom in. <laughs> okay, here we go. Penny could hear distant screams through her ringing ears as warm crimson blood trickled down her arms. She laid beneath the counter, knees in her hands, as she felt the world crumble around her. She couldn't scream. She didn't have the strength to call for help. All she could do was wait. Wait for someone to find her, shivering in a ball, or her corpse, frozen in place, and being eaten away by the remains of the building. As Penny began to gain focus on her hands again, she looked around the room. Wires hung from the ceiling, sparks suicidally jumping out of them to the cold floor below. Rubble barricaded the door, shards of shattered glass scattered the room. Penny looked around to her reflection in a pool of her own blood. Penny wasn't exactly the popular kid. Her best friend Jess was her only friend and she was a geek. Sometimes she wished she had more at school than just a girl who could do calculus in her head, although a lot of the time that was very useful to her. Academically, Penny wasn't talented either. She wasn't a great problem solver and there were no classes in school that made her excited. She just wanted to be herself, rather than another kid who was forced through the education program. It made no sense to her why every child had to learn about different types of rocks. Who cares if a rock is igneous, metamorphic or sedimentary? To Penny, there are white rocks, grey rocks, black rocks and some with magnificent colours. It could be her mother who influenced what Penny thought about education. She was never strict on her, but she never really cared about her and Penny was sure that somebody else told her mother that she had to go to school. Maybe she should have done that with what, what her, sorry, maybe she should have done what her father did. She should have packed up her bags and said goodbye forever. But now, it was too late for goodbyes. Penny tried to stand, careful not to bash her head on the countertop. There, laid out in uneven rows on crooked shelves, were plushies of some of Penny's favourite robots from when she was only a child. She could have even called them her friends, until she met Jess. She picked up a Freddy Fazbear plush from the lowest shelf. The room's lack of lighting made the plushie look scary, its shadowy eyes made it look angry and the nose didn't look like one Penny wanted to boop like she used to. The poor Freddy looked damaged. One of the ears was ripped and his bow tie was crooked. Penny let out a tear. She sat him down on the shelf, straightened his bow tie and gave him a warm hug. It's okay, Penny whispered. We're here together, just like all those years ago. She sighed and held him out in front of her. If you go, then I'll be right there with you this time, I promise. She gave him one final hug, letting a tear fall down her cheek, forming a single stream like the pathway of a snail. Penny remembers the time her mother threw out all of her Freddy toys because they were too childish for a high schooler. She loved the plushies so much, and for them to be just thrown away like that, it was horrible. At least she had met Jess by then. She wasn't left with nothing. Suddenly the whole ceiling began to fall out of place and crumble into itself, rain falling through the cracks and dust drifting through the room. Penny dropped Freddy in fear. She quickly turned toward the darkness, but the building hadn't collapsed yet. Penny knew it was only a matter of time. She couldn't hear herself think over the high-pitched screams denting her eardrums, so she, quif she, she swiftly ducked back down under the counter into her pool of blood again. Now, the one tear led straight into a long stream of salty tears. Reaching into the back pocket of her denim jeans, she grabbed her pack of tissues and wiped away her tears. She then tried dabbing at the streams of blood trickling down her arms and dripping at her fingertips, but there was too much for a single packet of tissues. She looked down. Freddy Fazbear was bathing in a puddle of Penny's blood, staring into her eyes as she felt her heart melting away. In the corner of her eye, she spotted something in the room, a pile of these strange paper plate dolls that some kids must have made. 
One of them looked like Freddy himself, another looked like a bunny, who Penny assumed would be Bonnie, and the other looked like, well, Penny didn't know who it was. Probably one of those weird new plastic robots they were walking around, Freddy's at the party. Across the wall spread posters of animatronics and drawings of the characters that small children must have done with crayons. There was one drawing of a huge slender figure giving a wrapped up gift to a child stick man. The child had a big droopy nose which Penny chuckled at, but the shadowy figure must have scared her. Uh, I don't know why I put must have in there, but the shadowy figure scared her. It could have been the face. Penny walked towards the door in fear and reached for the handle. It was very warm, but she didn't care as long as she could use it to escape. The door wouldn't budge. She tried kicking the door through and screaming for help at the top of her voice, but nothing happened. Penny put her ear to the door. It was difficult to hear as her ears were still ringing, but she could hear a soft, gentle crackling sound that reminded her of Christmas at her grandparents' house. This definitely wasn't Christmas though. Above her, the ceiling gave way again. Dust invaded Penny's eyes as she leapt out of the way to, of the falling rubble. Light shimmered into the room through the holes, revealing a huge gift box in the corner. It was the biggest one Penny had ever seen. She wished she had gotten presents this big at Christmas. On the side of the box, there seemed to be some sort of lever that you could wind around in circles. Penny found the strength to try it out, and she used the force in her arms to wind it up. It started playing these high-pitched piano sounds, and the song it was playing sounded familiar. This was a music box of some sorts. She kept winding. Penny figured the song was Pop Goes the Weasel, and she assumed that it w that meant it was more like Jack in the Box. Just as she thought, the gift box opened up and lifted out of it was a long, shadowy figure. The top of a mask was lifted by strings from the ceiling, slowly revealing strangely curved eyes that stared into Penny's soul, purple tear streams, red cheeks, red cheeks sorry, and a huge gaping black mouth, smiling into freedom. It was the same puppet character from the children's drawing. A young girl's voice started whispering in her head. Hello Penny, welcome to Prize Corner. The puppet's head didn't move to look at her from above, and the mouth didn't move to speak. Uh, thanks? H who are you? Penny was hesitant to speak to an inanimate object. I am Julie, and I am here to give you gifts. She had a strange exclamation to her voice. It was somewhat adorable, but Penny stayed paranoid. Her full body was out on display, and its lanky thin body towered over Penny. What's wrong, Penny? You seem unsettled. I'm only here to help. Penny didn't know what to say. How do you know my name? Judy didn't respond. I'm stuck in this room. I'm bleeding and I need help quickly. Penny was now desperate. Would you like a cuddly toy? What are you, Santa? I need to escape. I need an escape route or some way to contact my mum. Please give me something to work with here. Penny was speaking very quickly. Calm down, my child. Everything will be okay. I don't need therapy either, whoever you are. I have just a thing for you, my dear. What? Jess ran out of the building as quickly as she could. This was the worst birthday party ever. Last year, she went to the theme park with all of her friends and she had the time of her life. Apparently, she caused too much chaos at the park last year, though. And so this year, her mum decided it would be better to go, to, to go crazy at Freddy's. Now look how it ended. It was probably Penny's fault. It's always her fault. Jess pretended to be her friend, but it was difficult. She knows that Penny is just a burden to her. Penny always used to copy her homework in class and get three grades higher than her. Penny never said what Jess wanted to hear. She was never honest about anything. She didn't care about anyone. She didn't care about anything. All she cared about was making Jess's life a living hell. When Jess's grandmother was ill, all Penny wanted to talk about was her Ponymon cards. When her grandmother passed away a few weeks later, Penny laughed at her and told her she deserved it. Yet after all of the pain that she put Jess through, she got A grades, she got praise from her teachers and love from her grandparents. Jess couldn't throw her away, because her parents loved Penny too. They didn't know what she did to her. It's always Penny's fault that everything in Jess's life gets ruined. Jess ran to her parents. Oh my gosh! Oh, sorry, I said that wrong. <laughs> oh my golly, are you okay, Jess? Are you hurt? Is everything okay, my dear? Her father must have thought she was in a plane crash. You can still talk, can't you? You haven't lost your voice box yet. Please say something. I don't want to lose my little bean. 
Uh, by the way, uh, fun fact, uh, you'll, th that's like a little Easter egg if you've been watching my channel recently, uh, the little bean joke. Uh, he was very exaggerated all the time, but at least he cared, unlike her mother. Dad, I'm fine. The destruction isn't even that bad. I ran out as soon as I heard about it. The building started crumpling and tearing apart and half of the building went up in flames. Her father knelt down and gave her a hug. Also, please stop calling me Little Bean. That sounds like something a weird cartoon would say. The firefighters arrived with an ambulance and they started running towards the building. It was a pretty huge fire now that Jess looked at it. It looked tough to put out. There were crowds of people gathered outside the building in a parking lot, some families from the party and some Freddy Fazbear employees, and the emergency services came over to ask a few questions. Is everybody here okay? Does anyone have any injuries? Nope, we should be all good here. Luckily my daughter's voice box wasn't taken out. That wouldn't have that would have been awful, Jess's father replied jokingly as the crew looked at each other in confusion. Uh do you know if there's anybody still left in the building? Jess thought for a while. She looked around. The Coopers were here, the Smith twins, even Oscar made it out alive. That's surprising. He tripped over his shoelaces the other day and they weren't even undone. Wait, where was Penny? She wasn't here. This was the time. This was the time for revenge. Penny did everything she could to make Jess have a life of hell. It's time for sweet, sweet revenge. Uh, no, I think everyone's out here. In fact, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is everyone from the party. Jess said with confidence and a slight smirk on her face. And why should I accept this? Penny asked. Life as a puppet is a lot better than you think. No laws, no rules, no taxes. But I become a puppet. Life on strings. It's worth it, Penny. It costs absolutely nothing and you can have infinite amounts of fun. Penny thought for a second. All her life she had been miserable. She'd had one friend and a bunch of toys that were thrown out. She's had a terrible mother and no father. She has no potential and will probably never be able to get a job. Why should she sit and suffer as Penny when she can be someone like Julie? Okay then, I'll do it. Are you sure, Penny? Are you sure you'll be satisfied? I'll be more than satisfied. I'll be giving gifts. I'll have children drawing me giving gifts. And I won't have to go to school anymore. Excellent choice, Penny. Jump into the box and we shall begin. Penny climbed up and into the box and Julie started to lower further and further closer until the box was shut and Penny was left in darkness. Jess watched as the firefighters sprayed the last of the fire. She thought maybe she went too far with this. Maybe Penny didn't deserve what Jess did to her. But then she thought again. Of course she did. The men in the crew ran into the broken down pizzeria and came across a blocked off door that was left unexplored. They busted open the door and the light through smoke slowly revealed a large music box. What is it, Christmas? The men laughed. It was only June. A firefighter turned the lever round and round with confidence and strength. A high pitched piano started playing the tune to Pop Goes the Weasel as the box opened and strings lifted Penny's corpse into the air by her neck. Her eyeballs ripped out, tear streams of warm, blood trickling down her cheeks with a huge gaping grin on her face. There you go. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so this is what I love about this story. No, I'm joking. Um, I actually really like how, I, how I've done this. I like that ending. Uh, that's the only part that I can really talk about because I, like, this is, I basically wrote this entire story just so that I can have an ending like this because I knew this is how I wanted the story to end. I wanted like someone to turn into a puppet with like their their eyeballs ripped out and a and a huge gaping grin on their face and stuff. That's how I knew I wanted to end, so I had to kind of like make a story based off of that. Anyway, yeah, that's that's basically the end of the book. Uh there's a bit about me and oh. Oh, there's a teaser. Well, well let's let's read this, I guess. Jerry walked into the room with books across the shelves, a rug laid across the wooden floorboards and a desk ahead with the name Dr. Ozoni Zone written on it. The doctor in the swiveling chair turned to face him slowly. Well, 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 my son. What are you doing here today? He's always had a strangely crackled high-pitched voice. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of forgotten how I... <laughs> I forgot how I wrote this. <laughs> 
Let me, let me redo this. Let me redo this. The doctor in the swiveling chair turned to face him slowly. Well, 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 my son. What are you doing here today? He's always had a strangely crackled, high-pitched voice. It's Penny. That stupid girl. What is she up to now? Smoking with her non-existent friends? Bullying her sister? Sleeping with other men? Dad, don't be too harsh on yourself. One day you'll find the perfect woman for yourself, and you'll be happy. Dad, I... The sooner you leave her, the sooner you'll be free. And the sooner you'll be single, dancing around like a prat in a strip club with hundreds of other girls. She's dead. Okay? She's dead. Jerry couldn't cry through his rage. She went to Freddy's with her friends and never came out. You heard about the bomb, right? The entire place was nothing but debris afterwards. Penny was in that. And you don't give a damn. I don't know why I ever came. You never cared about me. You never cared about Penny. You never cared about yourself. And, oh sorry, you only ever cared about yourself and your stupid pseudoscience. Dr. Zone needed a second to think up a response. Look son, your mother passed away a few months after you were born. I still have all of those photos from our time together. Pictures of our best memories and pictures of you inside that huge belly of hers. <laughs> When she vanished that one day, it felt like I was left with nothing. But then I realised I was left with something. I was left with you. And I didn't need any more. Joey's father sighed. There's probably something I should show you. A single tear slowly trickled down Jerry's cheek as his father opened the elevator that took him straight down to his lab. I know how to feel. I know how it feels to lose someone, son. It hurts. Jerry had no idea what he was about to be shown. Dr. Zone was always full of surprises. So what if there is a way to stop the pain? What if there is a way to never feel the pain in the first place? What if there is a way to bring somebody back to life? Dad, you know that's impossible. Nothing's impossible, son. In fact, it's very possible. Just look with your own eyes. As the door to a huge underground room slowly opened, Jerry dropped his jaw in shock. Many, hundreds, thousands of robots were scattered across the room. Some of them laid on the floor, some of them attached to the wall, others hovering in the air like a helium balloon. Robots are the future, son. If a flame burns out, there must be a way to reignite the candle. There must be a way to reanimate the dead. Dr. Zone's voice was a tad shaky. All of these robots were prototypes, if you will. So you have some that aren't prototypes? His father ignored the question and proceeded to take Jerry through the next corridor in silence. On the other end were about 50 more robots thrown on top of each other, but incredibly different to the ones in the previous room. These were strange, long, lanky, skinny bodies, arms like snakes. Each robot had a different face. Some were happy, others were sad. Some didn't even look like faces to Jerry. What are these? Jerry didn't know if he wanted an answer or not. Puppets. <laughs> Dr. Zone gulped. They give gifts. They give life. Don't tell me I built one for your mother. Why, Dad? Why? You are crazy. Do you have emotions? Do you feel anything? Everything you do is so monotone. Everything you say sounds like, oh yeah, I'll just do this, I guess. You don't care about me at all. You were just left with me. An inconvenience while you worked on turning your wife into a stupid robot. I'm sorry. I had no choice. You are disgraceful. I know. But the robots are far from stupid. They think they aren't made of ones and zeros. I was able to make them for Freddy's in the end. But if that isn't a big success, uh, uh, if that isn't big business, I don't know what is. Dr. Zone felt as though he needed to clear things up. I put your mother's soul into one of these puppets. Now she's spending all of her time giving Freddy Fazbear plushies to small children. I guess that's not all so bad. Jerry just wanted her buried like everyone else, but instead he had to have his special crazy dad. I don't know what to say. You don't have to say anything. It's just me and you, father and son. I get that you're mad at me. I understand maybe I didn't care for you as much as I should have, but I couldn't deal with her gone. How did you two even meet? At this weird bar, I knitted out to her and she seemed to like it. Then I asked her out and now I can't go to the beach without thinking of her name. He chuckled. Wait. What even was her name? Julie. Yeah. So, uh, that's your first bit of ozone law. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're gonna have to wait until the next book to see what happens.
yeah. So, enter the competition. Uh, deadline is 15th of uh, August. Is it August already? It's almost August. Anyway, that's that's it. Goodbye. Thank you for watching. Thank you for reading. See you later.